Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my clock says it's six o'clock, and I would like for us to get started if we can. Uh, there's a, quite a bit I want to see if we can get through today. Um, I trust you, you can see my screen. Um, first thing you will note is that we have a firm final exam date. Uh, so you want to put it in your calendar. It is approximately three weeks away. Uh, so we have about three weeks worth of classes um, before the final exam, which is September 19th. Uh, we started this, this summer session late, so we're ending up late. But put it in your calendar. Um, I know a number of people have not been able to collect their, their exams from um, from the Institute. So I think we, it's probably best if we postpone going through that exam until, until Monday. Uh, most people did fairly well, um, you know, give or take. Um, there was some, um, some points given away that I, I, I thought did not necessarily need to happen. Um, for the most part, the essays were okay. Um, you know, we'll see how it goes. So on, on Monday, we'll go through it in detail. And certainly I will take up at the time any queries that persons may have regarding specific questions or specific um, markings on, on specific questions. All right. So if there is no other questions in that regard, um, there, there's also no homework today. Uh, probably, probably hand out homework on Monday, simply because I think there, there's more we need to cover uh, before before um, a homework would be worth our while. I want to see if we can get through at least two more homeworks before the end of the semester, so we'd have a nice round um, six homeworks um, for our assessment of that particular grade. All right. So last time, uh, we started talking about the economy in the long run. In particular, then we had gotten to the point where we wanted to have a better understanding of what causes economies to grow. And we said, after a lot of research by a lot of economists, and here we're talking um, real world um, analysis, as opposed to, to some textbook stuff, uh, what we call empirical work, so they actually went out and measured stuff. Uh, the two broad schools of thought, uh, two broad factors that we think are key when you're talking about economic growth. And we certainly can see how they apply, they would apply to, to our economy and to others as well. The first is capital deepening. Uh, and capital deepening just simply says, this is an increase in the, you know, the capital per labor worker, capital per worker ratio. That is how much plant equipment and machinery your workers have available to work with. Right? All we're saying is that the more technology, the more equipment, the newer, more, the more up-to-date, more modern um, facilities that your workers have available, it is expected that they would be more productive. And then being more productive, they're contributing more to the economic growth, not only of their company, but to the country as a whole. If they're more productive, then they're more valuable. If they're more valuable, then firms are going to want to hire these persons because they know that if I, with these persons and this new plant equipment and machinery I have available for them to work with, uh, this new resort, et cetera, I am going to come out ahead, right? And that's the whole process we talked about last class um, in terms of when there's an increase in the stock of capital, but this also works just as well as there is an improvement in the technology of the capital that the workers have available to work with, right? If, if you know, um, your bank outfits all of, all of your um, systems with the most modern up-to-date IT infrastructure, certainly it's expected that you would be more productive. Right. And so what we said is one of the things that 
um, sorry, the way in which the Bahamas particularly, we have benefited from this, you know, is that we have, relative to the size of our population, we continue to have a very large stock of capital and we continue to add to that on an ongoing basis. So we, we constantly see, um, particularly if you're talking about the tourism industry, which drives our economy predominantly, and even in the banking sector as well, we see this constant um, improvement in the capital resources, right? We see uh, new resorts being built, upgrading to existing resorts, uh, older hotels and, 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 and the like being decommissioned. Right? And in the financial services sector, we see a move to the, more, the most advanced uh, financial services product, products and services. Even if that means in some cases, dislocation of staff, uh, um, the kind of traditional banking services that customers have been um, used to uh, is gradually being phased out in favor of new technology, more online infrastructure. But the idea is that in, in our two predominant industries that drives our economy, you see this constantly increase and improvement in our capital stock. And what that has resulted in is, in general, the labor force of the Bahamas continue to be productive with this new capital. And that productivity has resulted in uh, a sharp rebound in our economy after COVID and, and Hurricane Dorian. But it also means that historically, the Bahamas has been growing faster and higher standard of living than a lot of our countries in the region. In fact, almost every other country in the region uh, and in the hemisphere with the exception of the United States and Canada. And that is driven overwhelmingly by the fact that we continue to increase the amount of capital that each worker has available to work with. Whether we're talking more, better, more up-to-date, more modern, more cutting edge. Right. So that is one of the big advantages that we in the Bahamas have had in that we're continually increasing the amount of capital that our workers are available to work with, capital deepening. Right. The biggest problem with capital deepening, though, is that if you say we need to continue to increase the capital that our workers are available to work with, that means we need to continue to finance that purchase of new equipment and machinery on an ongoing basis. Well, for most economies, that fund is coming from the banking system, where businesses are borrowing money from the bank um, for the purchase of plant equipment and machinery, building new hotels, building whatever. All right. Uh, and the money in the bank is almost always savings. It doesn't have to be a savings account, but savings. When you're talking savings account, fixed deposit, um, certificate of deposits, whatever it is, it's class. In this case, we're classifying it as savings. Right? That is funds that is not being used on it for day to day transactions. But we, in the Bahamas, do not save, at least not in the bank. Right. Now, you know, we can get at all kinds of conversations about why that's the case, uh, whether it's economic or social or cultural. Um, that's not really um, important for us at the moment, except to note that in general, we Bahamians don't say, well, we save very little. So if we save very little, that means there's very little um, financial resources available to the banks to lend out to businesses who would be investing in new and more modern capital equipment and machinery. But yet we're still able to do it. And the reason we're still able to, to do that, invest in all and plan equipment machinery is because we use foreign capital or foreign savings. And that comes into the Bahamas usually in the form of foreign investment. Right? in particular foreign direct investments. There's, there's two types of foreign investments globally. 
Uh, one is uh, foreign direct investment where an individual company comes in and builds a business or invests in a business or builds a hotel or builds a company, right? A physical structure, a physical investment, right? And that is what's called foreign direct investment. And that is what we see predominantly in the Bahamas. The other, the other type of investment that we see elsewhere is where uh, foreigners invest in the capital market, whether they're buying shares or stock or whether they're investing in government securities or whether they're investing in bonds of some company. All right. We don't see that very often in Bahamas to any significant extent because we have capital controls over that. Um, our, uh, in this case, our central bank uh, through its exchange control laws has, has made it clear that uh, we are not interested in that kind of foreign money. Because just as the rationale is, um, just as you can buy into say, um, you know, 100 million shares of Doctors Hospital today, you can just as we as easily decide tomorrow, well, I don't want this is more, give me my money and I go on. And that really causes concern in terms of if you're trying to maintain a certain amount of foreign currency reserves, especially because you, we in the Bahamas have a fixed exchange rate and the foreign country reserves allows us to protect and maintain that fixed exchange rate. So the last thing you want is people able, to, foreigners able to move tons and tons of money in and out of the country very quickly. It makes managing the exchange rate almost impossible. So a decision was made many years ago and, and is managed by the central bank to say, you know what, um, we're happy to welcome foreign direct investment. If you want to, you know, you know um, build, a, build a company, if you want to build a hotel, uh, um, run a business, you're welcome. If all you want to do is invest in the stock market, yeah, maybe maybe some other country may be a better place for you. Right. So when it comes to capital deepening, then we are able to benefit from other people's savings coming into the Bahamas in the form of foreign direct investment. And the more foreign direct investment we get, the more investment in capital, that increases the amount of capital that each worker has available to work with, this increase in the capital to labor ratio is what we call capital deepening. So uh, if you want to grow your economy, one of the key things you have to do is increase the amount of, of capital that your workers, your workforce, your labor force has available to work with. So that's one possibility. The second possibility is what we call a technological progress. All right. I say possibility, really, it, these are more in terms of requirements. Right. If, you want to grow, if you want to grow your economy, these are some boxes you have to be able to tick. All right. You have to be able to give your workers better plant equipment and machinery, more up-to-date modern technology, um, the latest and the most up-to-date. First things first. And secondly, you have to invest in what we call technological progress. All right. Now, very specifically, technological progress is defined as occurring when an economy operates more efficiently by producing more output without using more inputs. Right. So somehow you're able to produce more output without necessarily using more inputs. Examples including, you know, switching from candles to light bulbs, or now switching from incandescent light bulbs to LED light bulbs. More efficient, less wastage, less heat, less electricity, but you're getting the same amount of light for a given area, right? Moving from horse drawn buggies to cars, clearly, you're changing your form of transportation so you're able to produce more output. And the classic one, going from cloth diapers to disposable diapers. Uh, I don't think most of us were around when they had cloth diapers, or maybe you do, or maybe you're old school. Yeah, um, but I'm sure they couldn't have been much fun. 
And then, you know, hallelujah, praise the Lord, Pampas came along, disposable diapers, right? So technological progress is just really the ability to create more output without necessarily using more inputs. Okay, so the question is now, now that we know what technological progress is, how do we reach that goal, right? Um, what are the things that causes technological progress? How are we going to be able to produce more outputs without producing more inputs? Right? And the first key major issue, if you're going to talk about technological progress, research and development, R&D, but mo more importantly, R&D in fundamental sciences. All right? That is, we increase our basic understanding of the natural sciences, nature and the world around us, and this very often leads to new discoveries, more efficient ways of producing output. Um, you may have noticed, or maybe you don't, um, all the major universities in most of our countries, and we can use the United States as an example, are called research universities, right? uh, which means uh, their primary purpose is research. Oh yeah, we teach some students on the side, all right. But if you if you actually um, pay attention to what's going on in any university, uh, in fact, there is an adage, a mantra, uh, when it comes to university lecturers and uh, university professors, it says, "Publish or perish." It means your primary purpose is to do research that's going to lead to publications uh, in peer-reviewed journals, that is how you're going to make your money. That's how you're going to progress in university. That's how you're going to get tenure. All right. uh, so for most uh, universities, it tend to be research-oriented, right? where you have the lecturers and the professors 50, 70, 90% of their time is involved in research, and they also teach as well. Right. But the idea is that if we increase our understanding of natural sciences, you also have research labs um, following World War II. Um, the general acceptance is that what drove the US economy to be you know, where it is now relative to the rest of the world is R&D, research and development. The US has um, both private and public research labs. Um, first of all, they were very involved in sort of um, World War II um, war-related research. So you have the people involved in the atomic bomb and that kind of stuff. But then you have what they call uh, national labs, things like um, Fermi and Sandia, and there's maybe half a dozen. Um, and then you have, um, you have the US military, who, yes, they do do military research, but they also have a, a purely research arm called DARPA, D-A-R-P-A. Um, a lot of the work they've done is fundamental science is saying, okay, if I understand this better, sooner or later, somewhere down the road, this may translate into new products, new discoveries, in this case, that may aid our military, but a lot of the work is in fundamental sciences, right? All of the universities engage in fundamental sciences. Right? Um, most of the major universities in the US have, uh, for example, uh, they would have an astronomy um, division. Ooh. There. There is not, the idea is that we understand what's going on and that's going to lead to new discoveries. And one of the things that um, when the University of Bahamas, the College of Bahamas converted to university, one of the big issues for them was that, okay, how do we now begin incorporating more research and development into the university uh, as part of its DNA? Because that hasn't always been the case. It certainly wasn't the case under um, the College of the Bahamas. But there has been and continue to be an effort to say, let's try and move in that direction because we understand the value of research. Right. Okay. 
Uh, one last point on this. Um, as you all may know, um, I work for Central Bank and we have a very large research department. Um, now they're not involved in science research, but they're involved in economic research. And one of the things that the, 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 the bank does, the bank says, you know, we understand the value of, of research because we're an economic institution, we focus on economic research. Um, but each year we sponsor what's called the, a, a research competition, a TB Donaldson uh, Research Prize for Bahamian college students. And the winner gets a check, well, not check because we don't issue checks anymore, for $20,000. It's not, it doesn't go towards your school. Really, it's $20,000 that shows up in your bank account. Right. But the idea is that you reward the research and development efforts. Okay, so one way if you want to grow your economy is you improve an understanding of the world through research and development. Secondly, monopolies that spur innovation. Without the ability to reap rewards of motivation, a company will not fund R&D. Because listen, if, if there's no money in it for me, if I see no, no means in which I can make money, why would I in, invest in the laboratory work, the scientists, the, the testing, et cetera? Right? And one way of rewarding this uh, is by granting a monopoly. Uh, monopolies come in various forms, all right, so uh, a patent, for example, is a temporary monopoly. Right. You, you create a new product or a new technique uh, or a new advancement, and the government said, okay, you have the exclusive right uh, to this activity or product for a set period of time. And that is called a patent. It's also copyright and trademarks where it says, okay, I have, you have, no one else can make use of this very um, specific um, iconography that says this is your company or your product or your production or your facility, All right? Trademarks are similar, but in each case, whether you're talking a patent, a copyright or a trademark, it's in essence, it's a government granted monopoly. And the result is that it's intended to reward um, innovation. Right. One of the things we see um, um, for a very long time in the Bahamas was we had a company called Batelco. Uh, I'm sure most of us still remember the name, although it's, it's been a few years since Batelco existed. And for those of us of a certain age, we remember the nightmare that was Batelco. Batelco fought long and hard for many years not to allow cell phones in the Bahamas because it, they saw it cutting into their hardline monopoly that they had. And when they did get cell phone, it was a very, you know, uh, what we call now the brick. You know, it's a Nokia and the huge stuff and the bandwidth was terrible. And the charges were huge. Um, you were paying as much as, say, 25 cents a tax kind of thing. Um, yeah, um, I would feel so sorry for you if you take that phone out of the country. The roaming charges, yeah, and people can tell you about nightmares where yeah, you have two and $3,000 worth of roaming charges because you're gone for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. So and they had a monopoly, but they weren't innovating at all. Right. One can make the same argument for, for a, a BPL, formerly BEC. Right. Uh, but now, as a private company now, BTC, um, <clears throat> particularly when the government uh, allowed another phone company to be licensed, uh, in this case, it was Cable Bahamas, or no, it's not Cale Bahamas, it's a subsidiary alive. Now, uh, BTC formerly Batalco realized that, listen, uh, I need to get on the ball and stay on the ball here, else this new company is gonna eat my lunch. 
Mm -hmm. uh, part of that was because it's, it's now a private company as opposed to a, a government-owned uh, monopoly or government corporation, government-owned corporation, but still a monopoly. Uh, but part of it is now it has uh, intense competition. In neither case, uh, we saw uh, this new company, BTC, making an effort to innovate in the products and services offering to payments, and especially the cost, uh, in order to try and stay and maintain its share in the market. We also see this um, um, with the cable company, Cable Bahamas, as opposed to the telephone company, Alive. Where if you notice, practically every couple of months, Cable Bahamas is changing in their lineup, sending you these new bundles and packages. The idea is that they are they are, are unwilling to just stay with the same old thing month after month because they know um, that if uh, Bahamians get to a point where they are completely dissatisfied, um, it opens the room for somebody like BTC to get into the cable business, but it also opens the way for um, other companies to innovate and basically um, steal their market share. So they're constantly tinkering with their offering to the general public, um, getting whatever feedback they could, good, bad, and otherwise, and then trying to adjust their offerings to stay on top. They're trying to innovate to maintain their monopoly. But if this is the case, then uh, with many other companies, this is what causes the economy to grow. Right? You, you have companies who are willing to put in the time and the effort and the research to come up with these innovative products and services. They get the monopoly, the patent or trademark or et cetera. So now they're able to make money off this, then it makes sense for them. All right. All you need to do, for example, is look at the US um, um, pharmaceutical industry. It's a prime example of this. Okay. What else may lead to, to technological progress? You need a market that is sufficient in size to make it, make it worth the while of uh, investors and companies who are looking to develop and innovate. Right? If markets are, are too small, there are not enough rewards to be reaped. Um, fortunately for us in the Bahamas, we benefit from being so close to the huge US market. Right. And so in essence, when if you are a company existing in the Bahamas, right, you can actually consider, let's say, I don't need to only focus on the 400,000 Bahamians. I also can focus my attention on the five, six, or seven million visitors that also come to the country. Now, if I could get some of them as well, now, now you're saying something. So that's why um, if you look at this, there's been a complaint um, going on many, many, many years about the Bahamian music industries. And you hear this, this cry all the time about Bahamians not supporting Bahamian music right? and Bahamian musicians not being able to make a living in their own country. Well, I can't speak to Bahamians not liking Bahamian music or not patronizing Bahamian musicians. What we, what we can say very clearly is that trying to sell music to only 400,000 people right, is not a good way to make a living. Because let's assume for the moment, if we're still talking about the Bahamas, and let's assume we have, uh, I'm only guessing here, 30% uh, of the population who are diehard Christians, quote unquote, only listen to gospel music. Well, if you are a secular musician, now you're down to 300 people you're trying to market to, right? Now let's assume uh, half of those persons are under the age of 15, probably too young to be a significant market uh, for your music. So now you're down to what? 150,000 people. Now let's subtract the old people. 
you may be down to 100,000. Right. You see why I say the market is so small. But if you are somebody like, I don't know, uh, what's that group? Um, Baha Men, right? And you come up with a song like, Who Lets, who, what, who lets the Dog Out? Or who Let the Dog Out? Um, it was big in the Bahamas, but then you said, Whoa, okay. Now I could, what if I were to make this song available to all of my visitors in the hotels and play more baby music so they can hear? And all of a sudden, then it, it hits the US market. And before you know it, all of us are multimillionaires over one song. You need to have a market that's big enough all right, to provide uh, support for those individuals and entities and businesses who are doing the innovations. Right. Fourthly, what we're calling induced innovations. Necessity is the mother of invention. Right. Uh, if you have any grandparents who live on the family islands or grew up on the family islands, they could tell you about the ingenious ways of making do uh, because you don't have any choice. Uh, I grew up in a house with Lipton tea guy. Right. But I also know as a kid visiting my grandparents in Luthra on their farm, just about anything you can make tea with. Right. I'm drinking Dilsey tea, I'm drinking um, orange rind tea, um, um, uh, banana leaf tea. It, I don't know how that's supposed to work. And then this love vine tea, which you put milk in, uh, lots of sugar, um, and the list goes on. And I'm sure I, I've already scratched the surface of, of what uh, what people have been able to do. Uh, they've been able to make clothes out of croca sack. Uh, food somehow out of flour and water become some kind of porridge for breakfast kind of thing. And the list goes on. All right. Because you don't have any choice, you find new ways of doing things. Right. Uh, one of the best examples we had was um, in 1961, uh, 1960 President Kennedy was elected president. Uh, Federal Union Address in 1961. So inaugurated in 1961, and he challenged the U.S., the country as a whole, that we are going to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. Now understand, up to that point, the U.S. had not even put a man in space. Right? Um, the USSR had launched Sputnik um, in the late 50s and had put Yuri Gagarin, the first uh, person in space, uh, what, four years um, prior to this, three years prior to this, 1958. All right. So the US was behind in the space race. And it was a matter of prestige, et cetera. You know, um, and without knowing how or when or how they're gonna to manage to do it, he put a national challenge out there. Um, and they did it, 1969, right? But in essence, they had in to invent a ton of stuff on the way to be able to get somebody on the moon and back safely, right? Um, some of the examples coming out of the space program include things that we accept now as a given. Uh, the WD-40, which is the sort of um, lubricant most people have seen in the blue can kind of thing. Uh, power tools that didn't require cords. And so a battery operated power tool. Uh, we didn't have that before, but you did, there wasn't any place to plug this, plug the tool in on, on the rocket ship. So you had cordless tools, LED lights, Prior to this time, everything was incandescent, but you didn't want or need that excess heat um, in the space capsule. Um, speedo swimsuits. Um, the idea was that you want something comfortable and light that they can wear um, while they're in their space capsule and that didn't take up any space, but still provided a modicum of modesty. 
the Dust Buster. Uh, I don't know if you see, you don't see them anymore. Or maybe you still do. The little handheld vacuum cleaner. Uh, again, the idea that dust is a terrible thing uh, in a space capsule. Uh, memory foam, uh, sleep kind of thing. Um, enriched baby foods. That's what they ate. Uh, high nu nutrition, high density, high calorie, easy to pack and store. Uh, freeze dried foods, scratch resistant lands. And of course, we all know the Sanka orange drink mix, the dried uh, powder. And then a ton of more stuff came out, Velcro came out of the space program. Okay. All because it's saying, you know what, um, we need to get there and we need to all these things. And they keep coming up with new issues, new ideas to solve problems that allow them to get to where they want to go. Induced innovations. Right. Oops, sorry. And finally, and perhaps depending on who you talk to, most importantly, spending on primary education. Right. Now, we, every economist will tell you they agree investment in education always benefits the country. But investment, particularly in early education, primary school, pre K, K, whatever the terminology is, yields much more long term benefit than investment in any type of education. Right. If you can instill in, in children at a very early age, for example, a love of reading, a love of knowledge, basic educational skills, reading, writing, arithmetic, as they say, you, know, you start children off early, as early as possible, earlier than you might think possible. Right? Benefit is going to be tremendous as you go down the road. Right? And in fact, the argument has been made, uh, and you, know, um, you have this a debate that has never been quite satisfied, and uh, that this has been the fundamental stumbling block for long-term long -term economic growth in Sub-Saharan Africa. Because what we've seen a lot of the, for a lot of these countries, kids didn't go to school. And if they went to school, it was a very short period of time in any given day. And then um, the education was only relatively short and relatively poor. And then you have young kids, leaving school, never going to school to work because it's not in, you need to support the family. Right? So you end up having um, persons maybe all the way into their teens and their twenties with their family before they start getting any meaningful education. But what we see in the rest of the world and, and this argument that what we see in particularly in say, uh, a lot of the Southeast Asian countries, you know, where there is this intense um, interest in and focus on early education. Mm -hmm. So it may not be because they happen to be Asian, but maybe because they focus so much attention on early education. So if you're ever elected Ministry of Minister of Education, that's where you spend your money. Right. Uh, that's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. So those kind of, when we're talking about kind of things that will cause the economy to grow, not just short term, but also long term, invest in R&D, fundamental sciences. You build a, a base of knowledge within your community, within your economy, and that base of knowledge yield discoveries along the way. You do not just allow monopolies, monopolies in a come up with new and innovative products and services. You also need to make sure that you are able to provide a market that is big enough so that there are sufficient rewards that are available for these innovators. 
because without the, the, the potential rewards, they're not going to bother. Induce innovations that you, know, you continually look for new ways of doing things. You know I mean? um, back at the first Christie administration uh, had a policy that they were attempting to put uh, an Atlantis size or maybe half an Atlantis size resort in every major family island. Um, now, that's not where the induced innovation comes in. The induced innovation came in in terms of um, officials in the Bahamas Investment Authority now had to think of new ways of, let's say, how do we manage these foreign investment and foreign projects uh, in a way that's newer, more efficient than what we did before? If, if we're going to, to meet this challenge, it cannot take us 18 months to approve a project. Mm -hmm. Induce innovation. And finally, spending on childhood education. All right. So those are the kind of things we said, we know if we're going to grow an economy, we need to tick some boxes. Capital deepening and technological progress. If we can tick those boxes, we're well on our way to growing an economy. If we find that, okay, we're lagging one of those areas, so we know what we need to focus our attention on. So when we're talking about policy, we know what we need to aim for. Okay. That tells us what, why an economy will grow, but that doesn't always, that doesn't necessarily explain why we are moving up and down around our long run growth trend. Right. It says all that is saying is okay, if you put in these policies in place, you tick these boxes, your economy will grow over time. Right? Absolutely, positively, definitely, no question about it. It will grow over time. But in any given year, it may grow, it may fall, it may grow, it may fall, it may bounce around. Right? It may fluctuate around the long run growth trend. Right? Why? All right. So that's a question that we want to focus some attention on. Now that we understand why an economy would grow, okay, and if we look at it over the medium and long term, we can see the economy growing. That's nice. But on any given year, why is it not growing every single year? Why some years is growing faster than others, and then some years is actually declining? So why, why economic fluctuations? Right. That's the first thing we will consider. So classical economists have demonstrated that in the long run, the labor market will always return to equilibrium. Yes. Meaning that we assume that we will always have full employment in the long run. People simply cannot stay unemployed forever. They will eventually find a job, even if it's not in their preferred profession or for their preferred pay. Okay. Yes, we understand that. We remember that. But here's the problem. Uh, during the Great Depression in the 1930s, and even in recessions like 2008, uh, it is clear that in any given year, the economy may move away from its long run great growth trend. Right? It may deviate substantially from its long run growth path. It can sometimes, you know. Um, I'm seeing 2008 here, but I want, we need to look at 2020, right? And we deviated substantially from our long-run growth path. The long-run growth path for the Bahamas economy is just about two and a quarter, two and a half percent per year. If you look at the long run. 2020, yeah, our economy fell by some 20 something percent. I don't remember the exact number now, but I know it's 20 something percent, right? I would call that deviating from the long run growth path. Right. When this happens, and we can also put Hurricane Dorian in, in, in that mix as well, it is difficult therefore to say that when things like this happen, governments should not attempt to intervene in these short run deviations from the norm. 
it's kind of hard to argue that when, when you're talking recession in 1980, um, the, the 2008 financial crisis, or we're talking um, COVID and Dorian of 2020, when you have tons of people out of work um, and struggling, it's kind of hard to say that government shouldn't or don't have a role in trying to help the situation. Okay. So to discuss possible policies, we must first understand why the economy might deviate from the long run growth path and analyzing various policy prescriptions. So that's what we're gonna try and do. Okay, so as usual, we will look at the two, class, two schools of economic thought the classical economists and the Keynesian, and see how they each approach this issue of economic fluctuation, how they explain it in terms of what's going on. So we'll start with our classical economists. So the classical economists have put forth a couple of theories to explain why economies fluctuate along their long-run long growth path. Right? So classical economists are saying, listen, Here's one possibility, one theory, that it is real shocks to the economy that causes it to fluctuate along, around a long run growth trend. Real shocks, all right? Uh, Dorian is a real shock, all right? Uh, COVID-19, a real shock. Droughts, wars, natural disasters, a rapid shift in technology, uh, gas prices going through the roof something real substantial has to happen and that is what can cause the economy to fluctuate along, around the long-run growth trend right that's the and, and it's called the real shock theory and it makes sense i would think but here's the problem All right. there have been a number of notable recessions around the world that could not be adequately explained using this theory. So you had countries and you had economies that fell or rose, and it wasn't none of these events. No real shock to explain this. So it's like, wait, 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 wait. So what happened? I don't know. You know, uh, we didn't have no war, there's no drought, nothing, but yet our economy fell last year. On the other hand, there was also a number of real shocks that didn't lead to any recessions. And in fact, we know this from our own uh, um, um, economy in the Bahamas. Dorian did not cause the recession. We have had hurricanes before. We've had... Um, Wilmer, um, boy, okay, now I'm struggling to get names. Then David, but all those were before your time. Um, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and there are, we've had a number of hurricanes um, that have hit Grand Bahama, Abaco, Eleuthera, um, the islands down south. Right? And they did not cause recessions. And in fact, uh, Bahamian economists understand this quite clearly, and certainly um, at, the, at the central bank, we do, as long as Nassau, New Providence, isn't substantially affected, right, the, the likely result is not going to be a recession, and in fact, the economy can actually grow. Give you, a reason, give you reasons why. All right? Uh, we've seen this, let's start with Grand Bahama. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the hurricane. Uh, we had Grand Bahama and Alpaco were hit like back to back um, within a month. Uh, but one of the issues with particularly Grand Bahama, uh, when you go outside of Freeport, um, you get lots of flooding, low lying areas. Right? And outside of Freeport, Grand Bahama is a family island. Right. Uh, and all that that implies. So what happened was that we had a number of homes destroyed uh, in Grand Bahama and in Albuquerque. Uh, 
uh, and a number of, of agricultural communities, farms, et cetera, are devastated. So the government of Bahamas went into Grand Bahama Navico and took steps to replace and repair um, those homes that were damaged and destroyed and to provide assistance to farmers to get them back on their feet. Right. Sounds all good, uh, but here's the thing. You, let's say you, we've seen you had um, a home outside of, of Freeport, Eight Mile Rock, West End, East End, right? Holmes Rock, um, some of the other smaller communities in Grand Bahama, right? You may have a twenty, thirty thousand dollar home destroyed, right? Because the home been around forever, or wasn't built up to code, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Government comes along and builds, replaces that home with a new low cost home. At a minimum. That low cost home is going to be valued at probably about eighty to hundred thousand okay. dollars. So we lost the thirty thousand dollar home, and it was replaced by an eighty thousand dollar home. That means the capital stock of the country went up by fifty thousand dollars. Because now you have an eighty thousand dollar home, whereas before it was only worth thirty thousand. The economy is now better off by 50,000. Now multiply that by a number of homes in Grand Bahama and Abaco, and you see why, you know, no, not a recession, but in fact, you know, the economy as a whole may be improving. Then you do the same thing for, for the agricultural sector, right? A farmer who had this, this little plot of land that he was, you know, basically doing some subsistence farming on it, Government now provides him with new seed, new fertilizer uh, to get him up and running. And now all of a sudden now his farm is now producing and worth a lot more than it was before. When you look at the big picture, of course, we're talking macroeconomics, so we're talking about the big picture. The economy as a whole is now better off. Right? So you had a real shock, hurricane and hurricanes, and they didn't result in recessions. Real shock theory. We had recessions that we couldn't pin down to any real shock to the economy. And we had real shocks that didn't cause any recessions. Yeah, this, this theory didn't make it, all right? This theory has failed to gain wide acceptance because you know, it didn't explain what's going on in the real world. So that was the, the first attempt by classical economists to try and explain why economies fluctuate. Hang on folks, we're not done yet. We are classical economists, All right? Uh, so uh, classical economists, uh, okay. What about what is called the real, we're calling the real business cycle theory. Right? Now, this is Dr. Edward Prescott, uh, economist, of course. Right? He said, no, 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 okay, okay. It's not, it's not the real shocks, all right? It's not hurricane droughts, that kind of stuff. That's not what causes the economy to fluctuate. What causes the economy to fluctuate is change in technology and technological shocks. Ah, see? Yeah, you know, and technological technological shocks could be both positive and negative, and it is technological shocks that causes economic fluctuation, changes in technology. And he said, you know, I can point to an example. Right, the internet. Right, the economy, the global economy, has benefited enormously from the internet. Right. Uh, cell phones, right? Uh, it, it, that's a technological shock. Uh, it has increased the potential output for economies. You see where I'm going with this, he said. No, it is, we call it a real business cycle theory, but it's technological shocks that's causing the economy to fluctuate. And we said, well, why do economies uh, go down and not just up? Well, there, 
technological shock could be both ways. Uh, if, for example, um, you are in a war zone and your, your industry infrastructure, your electricity, uh, internet, those stuff are destroyed because of the war, it's a negative technological shock. See? Uh, makes sense, right? However, when economies went out and look at the real world, say, okay, all right, okay, I hear you, okay. Mm. Let's go check on some recessions that we can, we know it was a recession because we can measure economic growth and we saw a decline in economic growth in this country and that country and this country. And we decided, let's see if we can find these negative technology shocks that would have caused this recession. Uh, we didn't find it. Right. We saw recessions and we couldn't tie to no negative uh, massive technology shocks. We ain't seen that. But to make matters worse, we also had technology shocks and they didn't cause no recessions. We've had technology improvement and we see companies and economies didn't, didn't go anywhere. Um, I don't know, Prescott. It, 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 this, this don't look like this can work. And similarly to the real, to the real shock theory, the real business cycle theory has not been accepted by economists generally because it doesn't explain what's going on. You have stuff going on that it can't explain and stuff is kind of, it, it's trying to explain, it's not working out. Okay. So classical economists sort of struck out on being able to explain why economies are not doing, you know, we don't grow by 2% every single year indefinitely. How come we go up and we go down? Right. Classical economists cannot to this point come up with a, 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 a theory um, that is matched by reality. So let's let's look at what the Keynesian or short run economists say. Uh, what do they think? Right. So Keynesian economists. Okay, step aside. Here's our thought. Keynesian theory holds that economic fluctuations are the result of difficulties in coordinating, coordinating economic activities. What we're saying, Keynesian economists are saying, it is the price system. Because you know, everything in our economy has a price attached to it. It's the price system that helps coordinate economic activity in market-based economies. We're not talking about communism or socialism or any other ism. We're talking about market-based economy, capitalism. Right? It is the price system in market-based economies that coordinate economic activity. Coordinating economic activity meaning it tells some companies to grow, some people to shrink, uh, some, some jobs to lay off, some people to hire. Is pricing system that does it. Price control everything. And the problem is that economic fluctuation happens when the prices are not able to do their job as well as they can. Right? So economic fluctuations occur when prices are limited in coordinating this activity. So price runs everything. But the problem is that when price stumble, prices, the price system, and uh, that's why we get this. This, we can't manage our system quite well enough. So how, how do prices do this? And what are some of this limitation that prices have? So how do price coordinate economic activity? I started playing golf recently. Um, I have bought myself my first set of golf clubs, uh, bought a little glove to get in your hand, uh, and 
Yeah, every weekend I go on the driving range up at Blue Hill and I go hit balls around and pretend I know what I'm doing. Um, but I'm learning to play golf because I am no longer playing squash. I know if you know squash, squash is a much more active game. All right. I played it for many years. Um, now that I'm hit a certain age and slowed down a little bit, yeah, I can't be running up and down the court, sweating up a breeze like I could before. So I've switched from squash to golf. Now, what does that mean in terms of economic activity? It means that all the money that I used to spend on squash, including, you know, um, club membership and, you know, balls and rackets and tennis and shorts, all that, I'm no longer spending that money, right? So my demand for those products and services no longer exist. On the other hand, my demand for all things related to golf has now gone up right? because my interest has shifted from squash to golf. Right? In the larger scheme of things, very, very minutely, the price of squash equipment and et cetera would have fallen very, very slightly because my demand for it has gone away. There's one less person in the Bahamas no longer buying that stuff. So the price would be reflected in that very, very tiny, of course. On the other hand, there's one more person in the Bahamas interested in buying golf-related stuff, watching golf videos, um, lying to their friends about how, how far they hit the ball. Right? So in fact, in essence, if we're talking on a large scale, expenditures, my expenditures shifted from the squash-related stuff to the golf-related stuff. And we would see this as a change in the price of these activities. Similarly, let's say, for example, um, there is a rash of tennis elbows. Uh, for some reason, nobody can understand why most tennis players seem to be getting this debilitating thing, um, whether it's the rackets or balls, they don't know. It's very painful, very debilitating. Now, some people are much more reluctant to continue to play tennis or to begin to play ten, playing tennis. Right. If you are, um, what's, uh, what's, what's the sports shop? Um, the sports center. Right. You're going to see your demand for tennis rackets fall. All right. Now, all you know is that usually you were selling 50 tennis rackets a month at let's say $100 a racket. Right. Now, hey, second, uh, the end of the month has arrived and I still have tennis rackets on the shelf. And I see I only sold 40 tennis rackets. Right. What do you do? Anyone? You're running the sports center. Sorry? Surprise? Would you? You sell it. But I even if I only give a, a little long. But is that is that the first thing you can do? Repeat the, the scenario, please. You own the sports center. All right. You usually sell 50 tennis rackets in a month, right? And let's say this is August, right? Come September 1st, you look and you see that you've only sold 40 tennis rackets. Okay, well, if I do a, a next set of order, order less. All right, all right. So first things first, you wanna make sure that this is something real. No, no aberration or something like that, you know, a particularly rainy month. Right? 
So let's say you see you see what happens in September, right? If you say, well, maybe that's just August, maybe that's extra hot or something, whatever. And September, you see, you still you don't sell at fifty; you're still selling forty, right? Now, certainly, there's two possibilities, and you may do one or both. Uh, you may have a little sale to encourage people, you know. Now, um, a sale is nothing more than a, a decline in the price. All right. It's, you don't want to admit that you're lowering your price, so you call it a little sale, 5% off, 10% off. But the issue is that you understand economics, and as price falls, you expect demand to go up, all other things being equal. Possibility one. Same time, you decide, you know what? I'm not going to order 50 rackets. Maybe I'll only only on a 45, just in case. I mean, I know he sold 40, but you know, I don't go all the way down. So yeah, you see what happens. All right. And if that trend continues now, you find yourself in a position now, if I want to go back to selling 50 tennis rackets, I know my previous price of $100 a racket is not going to work. Yeah, I had the little sale, and the sale boosts my, sa my sales, but it didn't really get me back up to 50. So what I'm still trying to do then is that as, as an owner, I'm trying to find the right price that's going to get my sales back to where I want it to be. Does that make sense? All I'm trying to do is that, listen, I, I, I usually sell 50, 50 rackets a month. All right. Um, Clearly, I'm, I'm not selling 50 rackets a month anymore at my current price. I had a little sale, which is just a temporary lowering the price to see what happens. Because by lowering the price as a sale, that's going to tell me if this is a temporary phenomenon or this is a more serious problem that I need to take more drastic actions with. All right. I'm also going to lower my order from the factory and maybe not completely, but just enough to see what happens. Right? In both cases, you see now um, you're trying to find a price because that is going to allow you to meet the sales level that you want to meet. So you're adjusting your price accordingly. You don't know what the price is that's going to make your sales what you want it to be. So you're lowering it, lowering it. You start off with a, with a, with a like sale, but eventually you're trying to find that correct price that's going to allow you to sell the tennis rackets that you want to sell. Right Now, you are not pricing your tennis racket. You're trying to find a price out there that's going to allow you to sell the tennis racks that you want to sell. In addition, when you order less tennis rackets from your supplier, you are in fact sending a signal to your supplier that demand for tennis rackets has fallen. The supplier is then sending, sending a signal to the wholesaler that demand for tennis rackets has fallen. The wholesaler sends a signal to the manufacturer of tennis rackets that, that demand for tennis rackets has fallen. Now, the manufacturer of tennis rackets is going to think, okay, well, maybe I need to cut back on my production and maybe cut back on my staff because demand for tennis racks is falling. So that price signal, the fact that you could not sustain the price level that you had before, that is sending a signal to you, sending it to your supplier, to your wholesaler, to the manufacturer, that price is sending a signal to everybody that something has changed. Demand has changed. Similarly, if in fact people have switched because of this problem with tennis racket, you know, sports people can be sports people, they're just going to switch to something else. And let's say they switch to my sport now, golf, the reverse is happening. Same sports center guy, all right? Listen, you used to sell maybe a dozen sets of golf clubs a month. Now, you know, and you still got two weeks left in a month, but you already sold out. Well, the very first thing you're going to do is that you're going to raise your price and you're going to order more golf clubs next month. Right? Because 
you're going to raise your price because clearly, if at my old price I'm already sold out, then yeah, there's an increase in demand for golf equipment. So now you have a new price signal and uh, that goes to the owner of the sports center that says demand has gone up and the owner of the sports center is not going to order more golf clubs from his suppliers. Suppliers going to order more golf clubs from the wholesaler. Wholesaler is going to order more golf clubs from the manufacturer. The manufacturer is going to now produce more golf clubs, even though that means hiring more people. So you see the price signal that is saying uh, demand for golf clubs is going up. That price is sending a signal to everybody in the market that, listen, y'all need to act accordingly. So you see how prices, in fact, can begin causing activity in the market, coordinating economic activity, causing some, some production to go down or some production to go up. All right. So if we want to take it step by step, changes in the demand and supply for a given product may cause the price of that product to rise or fall. Right. We know this. Right. Um, changes in the price level will now cause retailers to purchase more or fewer items from their wholesalers or their suppliers. Eventually, these changes in prices provide a signal to the producers and to the farmers to produce more or less of a given product. Ultimately, this may result in an increase or decrease in demand for labor in particular industries. Right. So, and prices can do this in both um, subtle and gross ways. Uh, it, it sends a signal through the market that this is going on and you need to make an adjust, adjustment. I think we mentioned this uh, at some point earlier in our semester where we were talking about um, 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 supermarkets, particularly large-scale supermarkets and wholesalers, um, how they make use of the data collected by their cash registers who don't just um, take cash, they're actually computers and they, they keep track of inventory, et cetera. And we talk about how uh, um, supermarket owners, that they adjust prices of items very slightly one way or the other to see what happens. And this is exactly the same thing, all right? They are searching for the price that they know is out there that's associated with a certain level of demand. Right? We like to think that businesses are pricing their items, but in essence, certainly well-run businesses are searching for that market price that they know is out there somewhere. All right, so they make the adjustment of their pricing level to try and reach that certain price that's going to tell them what they want to know about demand for their product or service. Right? So it's prices that really run things. Right? And prices are driven by changes in demand and supply for products and services. Right? So our changes in our demand and supply causes the price to change. The prices then, then um, coordinates all the other stuff going on in the economy. Okay. All right. Oops. Oh, yes. Uh, this is just sort of reinforcing our conversation. For example, that we saw, uh, if we're looking at the diagrams on the right. All right. So COVID-19 caused a demand for all sports equipment to fall. I'm sure you would agree with that. Um, we were stuck at our houses for the better part of the year. All right. So we had a, a inward shift in the demand curve for all sports equipment. Uh, you know, whether you're talking cheap stuff, like middle, middle price stuff, expensive stuff, whatever sporting event, uh, sporting equipment, you know, demand fell. And you would expect then that the price of sporting equipment would also, dec also decline because demand declined. Right. So sports equipment producers and suppliers would, of course, drastically cut back on their production because nobody outside playing anything. And, then, and they also laid off a ton of people 
because we're not producing anything. All right. So in that case, you saw where um, a decline in demand, in this case for all sporting equipment, caused the price of all sporting equipment to fall and ultimately resulted in a lot of people working in the manufacturing sector to lose their jobs. Similarly, in the Bahamas, we saw it in the hotel sector. Because of the pandemic, there weren't any tourists coming. Uh, weren't any tourists coming, then hotels start laying off a lot of persons because we don't need them. All right. On the other hand, all of us who are stuck indoors right, need something to do. Now, I put board games here, but you can easily put here, say, um, um, shopping, say Amazon's or those type of people, um, Etsy and all the rest of the shopping online, because those activities increase enormously. I can also put here uh, delivery services. Right? Demand for those went up enormously. I can also put here alcohol consumption. Demand for liquor, I mean, people wanted to ride because they couldn't go to the liquor store, which made no sense to me because I had plenty of liquor in my house, but you know, that's, not, that's how it is. Anyway. But so we saw an, a shift in demand curve output and of course prices went up and we saw this as a signal going through all, all the, the market, right? So at the end of the day, we, we, pretty much clear on the idea that prices are the ones that are driving the market. Uh, a change in the price is going to affect all sorts of businesses down the line, right? uh, causing production to increase in one, production to fall in the other, more people to get hired on one, more people to get laid off in the other. Right? It is prices that's causing this coordinating activity in the economy. Okay, the, the biggest problem that we're gonna face, not we uh, in this class, but we as an economy, a market-based economy, is that producers and merchants, we cannot see demand directly. We talk about the sports center guy. He cannot see uh, that fewer people want to buy his tennis equipment. All you can see is that I was charging at $100 a, a, a tennis racket, I was able to sell 50 tennis rackets in a month. Now at $100 a tennis racket, I can no longer sell 50 rackets. Right. I don't know why, I can't see what's going on. All I know is that I used to be able to sell 50 at $100, now I can't sell 50 at $100 or more, something going on. At $100, I get to the end of the month, I still have tennis rackets left over. So producers and merchants cannot see change in demand directly, but they can only infer this from the perceived change in the price level. The fact that if I'm going to sell my 50 tennis rackets, clearly I need to have some kind of sale, something need to change. So they must depend on change in the price level to coordinate the economic activity. So I think we, we, we have a good answer that prices have a lot to do with this. The problem is that prices do not do everything. They can't do everything, right? And it is when prices cannot meet all the needs of the economy in terms of its coordination efforts. In classic, I mean, Keynesian economists are saying, this is where the economy tends to start fluctuating when prices are not able to do their job um, as well as they should be able to do. All right. And uh, Keynes and Economist says that there are three problems, all right, three problems uh, that we can identify that limit coordination through prices. All right. Three very specific, we know for sure where prices fall down. 
The first is where there aren't enough of them, right? Which seems strange because we think of everything in terms of price, but in fact, there are a lot of situations where there's not just not enough prices. Okay, so suppose you decide that uh, you and your brand new husband uh, are going to save up for a down payment for your house. Right. right now you're in an apartment. Uh, you're only living with your parents or his parents. You're in an apartment, but you really don't want a house. Okay. Fine, so you're saving up for a house. Here's the problem. All right. There is no mechanism for the prices to know that in five years, you will have a demand for a house. Because remember how we're defining demand. Well, in order for there to be demand for a good or service, or in this case, demand for a house, one must be ready, willing, and able to acquire that house. Right now, you may be willing and you may be ready, but you're not able. All right? So right now, you don't have a demand for a house. But you know that with diligent savings, as long as you know, nothing buck up, you, know, you guys will be in, in a position five years from now where you will be able to acquire that house, or at least the down payment. So same thing, all right? Five years from now, you'll be ready, willing, and able to build your house. But there is no price signal that demand is going to, that's going to be the case five years from now. See, for coordination to work, the prices must somehow be able to give the signal to the car manufacturer or the house builder or the contractor that there will be an increase in demand for these products at some point in the future. We don't have any price that says that. All right. We don't have any price that says this five years from now, uh, we know this couple of NASA that they, they're gonna be, they've saved enough that they can be going to the bank uh, for a mortgage or they're gonna be in the market to buy a piece of property. We don't know. All right, this becomes even of even greater significance when you scale it up, when large amounts of capital and very long lead times are required. All right. So for example, if you are, in, you are in the computer chip manufacturing business, all right, your Apple or Acer or, or, or IBM or, or whomever, all right? If you're contemplating building a new chip manufacturing plant, right, it, that is going to cost you uh, about four years to complete um, building this, and it's gonna run you two, three billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice to know that four years from now, what the price of computer chips are going to be? Because that will tell you a lot. Similarly, when they were building Bahama, three-year project, all right, uh, what, three and a half billion dollars at a time, I'm sure it's gone up since then. It would have been nice for, uh, in that case, this was, um, um, gosh, I forgot the name of the first guy who did, who lost the project. Uh, it's not Ismarillion, that was Atlantis. Uh, oh, okay, I don't remember his name. Boy, that's sad. Anyway, it would be nice to know that, you know, once the hotel is completed, I would know what my room rate could be. But there is no mechanism, there's no price that can tell you what the future room rate is going to be after you finish building your hotel. We don't have future prices. Well, we do have some future prices. There are some future prices on a limited number of goods. All right. For example, commodities. You know, um, you have the commodities exchange. The biggest one is in Chicago, the Chicago Board of Trade, um, where commodities we're talking grains, 
corn, wheat, soybean, etc. But it also includes um, uh, other other materials, including um, oil, um, frozen concentrated orange juice. If you watch that silly Eddie Murphy movie, I said trading places or trading spaces. I don't remember what it is. Um, um, there are some agricultural goods like bacon, really pork belly, because you know um, the whole belly of a pig, not just you know that nice little juicy, good, yummy bacony part. Uh, uh, they also um, have future prices for precious metals: gold, silver, palladium, platinum, platinum, uh, iridium, etc. Right, but this is just a handful. If you think of all the goods and services out there, um, these future prices are a very limited number of goods. And in fact, this started in the, uh, um, sorry, these future prices make up what is called the derivative market. And derivative market is nothing more than a market for future prices. Uh, uh, it's gotten much more complicated um, because, you know, when um, you put us, Geek, it's math and finance geek into geeks into it. Uh, you know, we like to play the numbers, but in simple form, all right. Uh, the future market really started up among farmers, uh, and they wanted to enter an arrangement with um, granaries, people who purchased the grains from them. So it started off with corn specifically, and wheat and soy. And it started with the farmers will say, okay, us and the owners of the granaries, the people who store the product, we got together. And we agree that um, the granary says, okay, uh, Mr. Demerit, I understand you have this, you know, uh, thousand acre farm, uh, you grow corn. Uh, we are willing to purchase from you, um, you know, 200,000 bushels of corn at $42 a bushel um, nine months from now when you harvest. Right. So we agree on the price and the quantity. Uh, we both uh, are committed and we write up a contract that says this. Now, come hell or high water, I have to deliver, I as the farmer has to deliver 200,000 bushels of corn. Right. Uh, the granary is not going to care that I had a bad year and the rain didn't come or the rain came too fast or I had some infestation. You have a contract to deliver to me 200,000 bushels of corn at $42 a bushel. As a farmer, I don't care that, in fact, uh, the market price for corn fell to the floor uh, in the interim time. All I know is that you promised me, you contracted with me, you're gonna buy my 200,000 bushels of corn at $42 a bushel come nine months, all right? So in fact, they have contracted a future price. Right? And that's how it started where um, the, each party was looking for protection against what may happen in the market in the interim. And now it's just it, it's grown to you know a, a huge industry, but very, very tiny compared to all the other products and services out there where there are no future prices. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems with, 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 with prices in terms of their ability to coordinate economic activity is that there's not enough of them uh, to talk about what's going on in the future and to factor that in in, in terms of sending signals. Um, to various people within the market that this is going to happen at some point in the future. Not enough prices, particularly when we're talking about future prices. Problem number one. Problem number two. Prices don't always give us enough information. All right. Prices do not always give us enough information about changed changes in demand. It should be change, it's not change. Just because uh, we see uh, prices creeping up, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's an increase in demand for that item. 
the price could be creeping up because of inflation. Think of what we see now, you go to the supermarket and you see prices going up. You know for a fact, the prices in the supermarket are not going up because more and more people are trying to buy this stuff. You know the price is going up because of inflation. But the, the problem is that when you look at the price, only the only thing that you can see is the price is going up. If that, in the case of inflation, if you are a manufacturer or if you are a producer, all right, you should not increase your production. Normally, when you see prices going up, that thinks demand is going up, that means I need to increase my production so I can take advantage of these higher prices. All right. um, because people want to buy more stuff. But in the case of inflation, no, the producer should not increase production because you know, um, my costs are rising because of inflation, but demand is not going up. Right. As a manufacturer, as a producer, as a farmer, you are interested in the real price. That is the price of the product relative to other prices in the economy. That brings us to the reality principle. Right. As a manufacturer, as a producer, as a farmer, you are interested in the real price after they've stripped out the impact, the impact of inflation. Because that's going to tell you what demand is. So one of the biggest, biggest problems with, with prices in terms of their ability to coordinate activity and why um, sometimes it screws things up is because it doesn't give us enough information. When you see a change in the price, you cannot automatically see how much of this is because of demand went up and how much has occurred because of inflation. You're guessing. So there are times when um, producers get the wrong signal from prices. They, they make a mistake. They think prices are saying, uh, this increase in prices is saying there's an increase in demand, so they start producing more. Okay. The cost goes up, but demand hasn't gone up, so now they're losing money. Right. It could the opposite could be true as well, right? Where um, manufacturer producers see the price rising, or retailers see the price rising and assume it's inflation. On the other hand, it may just be a change in demand, and then it means that they have not responded or not responded quickly enough to change in demand. And again, we see that having an effect on the overall economy. So whether we're responding too fast or not fast enough, the result is the economy is not producing as efficiently as it can. And we, and we see that in terms of fluctuation in economic output. We either producing too much or not producing enough, and that causes the economy to bounce around because we just can't get all the information we want from prices. Right? You know, like how um, we would very much like to see when you see the price of an item in the supermarket, you would like to see this is the price, this is VAT, and then this is the total. So you can see, okay, now I see what the total is. I know how much of that is VAT and how much of that is the real price of the item. Well, it's the same thing. When we look at an item in the supermarket, we like to see how much of this is the real price, how much of this is inflation, and then we can see what the total is. But the prices don't do that. And, and so sometimes it means that we're not getting the correct signal to the market and that causes economic fluctuation. So on the one hand, we may have economic fluctuation because there are not enough future prices. You know, uh, because the price, the price cannot signal what's going on, what's going to happen. And secondly, uh, the price may not give us enough information. Again, that may cause economic fluctuations. And finally, big issue with prices is that they're sometimes sticky. That they don't always respond immediately when there's a change in demand. Right. Um, Specifically, we said there are two types of prices out there. 
one we're calling auction prices, and one we're calling custom prices. Right. So auction prices, we're defining as prices that adjust very quickly, or at least on a daily basis. And sometimes they even more quickly, right? Fresh fish is a good example. You go on, on the dock, but well, they sell fish on the dock anymore? Probably not, hey. You probably need to go out uh, Montague, right? You go out first thing in the morning, when the fellas just come in. Fish is priced at a certain price. But as the day goes on and it gets closer and closer, five, six o'clock at night, right? Um, that fisherman knows that, listen, I need, I need to just get this stuff sold. Right? I can't be put, bringing them home more fish. You know, my freezer already full up. Uh, and you know, y'all behaviors, you don't like frozen fish. You know, I can't bring these fish back tomorrow and try and sell them because y'all can say, look at that glass. Yeah, no, 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 that ain't fresh. Et cetera, et cetera. You know, you're picky like that. So as a customer, you then end up in a much stronger position to negotiate a lower price for the fish. So in essence, the price of the fish is being adjusted downward right, during the course of the day. Similarly for vegetables, not as quickly, but if you are if you are a you sell vegetables, a fruit stand or something side of the road, you know there's only a limited time you have available to you to sell that item before it becomes unsaleable. Right. We see here in the Bahamas, um, price of gasoline changing all the time. Right? Certainly not on a daily basis, but at least on a weekly basis, or sometimes on a daily basis, but more often it's weekly or even monthly basis, we see the price of gas changing. Right? Stocks and shares, the price of these items um, change on a minute by minute basis. So here for auction prices, these prices are just quickly and easily. Right, to a change in demand. On the other hand, we have what is called custom prices. Custom prices are prices that adjust very slowly. Industrial machines. Quite frankly, the price of a tractor or a backhoe or one of them big multi-ton trucks, right? that price can be what it is probably for the next five, 10 years, maybe longer. Right. Imagine the price of you installing some production uh, industrial machine uh, in your business. All right. And so these the prices of these items change very slowly. All right. Um, labor contracts is a good example too. Um, we we're very familiar in the Bahamas about um, the most uh, public labor discussions tend to be between the hotel workers and the hotel union. I mean, the hotel union and the hotel, all right? Um, yeah. So they get together, they round, they fuss, and they make noise and they threaten because that's what unions do. Um, and they come up with some kind of agreement. And the agreement, the labor contract says, it, it stipulates all the various categories of workers. It says, this is what we agree that you should pay these workers. Right. So if you're saying this is a housekeeping staff, you know, and they and we agree that they should be making, I don't know, um, $10 an hour. I don't know, maybe that's too much. I don't know. Uh, so you agree? Hotel says, boy, that's a lot. But anyway, I right, fine. And they do that for, for all the various categories of workers. So now you have a contract. And the contract runs for three years. And come hell or high water, that's the price of labor for the three years. So for the three years, prices are fixed. Right. Very sticky. Right. So what happens if um, corona happens in the middle of your labor contract? Right. Ideally, uh, the company, if we're a regular company, uh, 
would be able to reduce the price of labor because the demand for labor has fallen. We don't need many people. We need people for as long as we need. Uh, we should be able to reduce the price of labor. But the price is negotiated in the contract, is fixed in the contract, and we are stuck. Right. The only option available to hotel then, and which one of these things that I built into this particular type of contract, is that since we can't change the price of labor, right, the hourly rate, if you will, the only thing we can do is change the number of hours. Right. Um, so since uh, we cannot reduce, the, you know, we have agreed to ten dollars an hour, right? Uh, which works out to what four hundred dollars a week. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. Uh, in a typical week, uh, a typical five-day week, but because we don't need as many people, and we, which means we don't need as much workers working as much hours, uh, we're still going to pay you ten dollars an hour, but we only need you for twenty hours, not forty hours. Uh, which works out to what uh, two and a half days. So now instead of a five day week, you're working two and a half day week or two day week or one and a half day week or one day week. Right? We can't change the price because the price is fixed in the contract. So we, we, our only option is to adjust the number of hours. Now, the reverse is also true. As things have rebounded very quickly for the hotel sector, hotels are now um, looking to add hours to the work week. So now you have people working six day week instead of five day weeks, or seven day week instead of five day five day week. Right. Same ten dollars an hour, but now we are demanding additional hours mm -hmm. because the prices are sticky. The prices are fixed until there's a new labor contract. So price stickiness requires us to make some adjustments. New rules if to coordinate economic activity. Because you can see where if you have sticky prices, uh, the economy cannot adjust as quickly or as easily because of the stickiness of the prices. So, Something has to give. All right. Price stickiness require alternative rules to coordinate economic activity. In general, workers and firms allow demand to determine level of output in the short run. All, right. All that means is that more, more guests come to the hotel, people start working longer hours. All right. We don't pay the workers more, we just add a number of hours. We also see this where firms often negotiate long-term contracts with both suppliers and laborers, which sets the price in the long run and allows output to fluctuate. Right? We see this in an industry like the steel industry or something like that, where you have a car company would negotiate with the steel industry right, that um, we will purchase steel from you at whatever dollar price it is uh, per ton. Right? And that will be the fixed price of the steel. But what will fluctuate is how much tons we will purchase. We'll allow that to fluctuate. Right? And it's important here, now one last note we want to stick on here so that we understand, because we talked a lot about the short run, et cetera. In economics, macroeconomics specifically, but economics in general, the short run, is a period of time in which prices are fixed. So when we're talking about a short-run contract or long-run contract, we're just talking about the time in which the price is fixed. Okay. Any questions before we start um, moving on to more broader aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and start talking about fiscal policy? Mr. Demerit. Yes, ma'am. The um, um, this is about one, two, three, four pages back. <laughs> one, two, three, four pages back. Too little information. 
no, go back to more. I, I want to see the, 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 the diagram with me. Right, okay. right there. Okay, remember now, we, we, I mean, you are discussing with the uh, items to the sports shop. Sports center, yes. Yes, okay. So diagram up to the top, it was basically what we discussed in reference to the rockets, um, the decrease in the selling of the rockets. Yes. And oh, the right. one to the bottom is the increase of the um, gulf. The demand in, in the in the Gulf, um, oh Lord, sex? Is that what they call them? Gulf clubs. <laughs> okay, the Gulf clubs, right? And that's what that is, right? Yep. Okay. But 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 uh, this really is talking about the whole economy as a whole, not just that particular industry. But but the analysis is exactly the same, right? Uh, if demand falls, right, for whatever reason, all right. Um, we would see this as an inability of a company to continue to sustain the price that it is charging. Right. And, so, and, so what that, what that would so what that would mean then is that um, you would find as you're the, you're the owner uh, that you just can't continue to price things the way you're pricing before and get the sales that you used to get. And that so you, is why, sorry, and so that is why the little digits that are in the P, which is the price, now I give you notice that the P star is straight right. line. Right, that's our, right. That's where we start. The P1 is the breakdown, and so that basically shows the decrease in the price. Yes. Okay, all right. And then the opposite for the bottom. Yes. The P star comes below, the P1 go up. So that's the so, increase of the demand and the increase of the price. Exactly. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are now returning all the way back to the very beginning. All right. We started off this class talking about demand for goods and services and supply of goods and services. All right. But we are macroeconomists. We are big picture people. So ultimately, our interest is not in the demand for any specific product or service. Our interest is in the demand for all products and services in the economy. So, and that is what we're calling aggregate demand or aggregate meaning total demand. So the aggregate demand curve it's a demand curve, so it's always going to be downward sloping. The aggregate demand curve plots total demand for real GDP as a function of the price level. So aggregate demand curve says this is demand for all goods and services in the economy, and this is the price of all goods and services in the economy. So the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping because all demand curves are always downward sloping because of the law of demand. The aggregate demand curve is downward slope because of change in the price level. Right. So when we're talking about the change in the price of one item, we can talk about the price of that one item. But when we're talking about the change in the price of everything, that is by definition, inflation, All right? Inflation is a change in the price of all goods and services in the economy. So now we're talking big picture now, we're talking about the whole economy. We're talking about GDP, which is all the things produced in the economy, and inflation, which is a change in the price of everything in the economy, right? So demand curve, instead of having a downward sloping curve for just one product, we have a downward sloping curve for all the products. It's a slightly different shape, but it's the same downward sloping curve. So the, the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping because a change in the price level changes the purchasing power of money held by the public. That's economics. What we know in common language is that we see it right now. As inflation goes up, you go to the food store, prices are going up. Clearly, 
you don't feel like your money can go as far as it used to go. You feel less wealthy. Right? The purchasing power of your money has fallen. It can't go as far. That is the reality principle. What, we, what we're interested in is how far our money can go. The purchasing power of our money. And because of inflation, uh, we see that the purchasing power of our money has fallen. Right? Our, the wealth effect, how we feel, has, has declined. Right. What would cause a shift in the aggregate demand curve? Right? We talked uh, about the kind of things that would cause the demand curve to shift. Right? We said, if there's an increase in the price of a substitute good or complementary good, that will cause the demand curve to shift. If there's a change in the population, that will cause the demand curve to shift. If there's a change in our taste and preferences, that will cause the demand curve to shift. If there's a change in our expectation of future prices, that will cause the demand curve to shift. But what about the demand curve, the aggregate demand curve? What would cause demand in the Bahamas for all? for all goods and services to go up? Or what would cause demand for all goods and services to decline? Right? So when we're talking about aggregate demand, we're talking about total demand for everything. All right, so what are some of the things that may cause this aggregate demand curve to shift? The first is, call, is the money supply. Right? The money supply is controlled entirely by the central bank. Every central bank, including our own. All right. uh, so they control the amount of funds banks have available to lend out. Various instruments, and we'll talk about that um, probably next week or the week after, because that's the last subject um, when we're talking about uh, for, the, for the class. But if money supply goes up, money supply is the amount of money banks have available to lend out. If money supply goes up, banks have more money to lend. Right? Banks are in the business of lending money. I know that doesn't seem like the case now in the Bahamas, but yes, they're in the business of making loans. That's what they do. All right? Because that's how they make the bulk of their money. So if money, if central bank puts more money in the hands of, of banks, all right. So if central bank increases the money supply, banks have more money to lend. Banks have more money to lend, they're going to lend out more money. And they're also going to lend out money at lower interest rates. And these loans will then be used to buy goods and services. And that will cause GDP to go up. And GDP going up means that the aggregate demand curve will shift out and to the right. Aggregate demand is total demand for all goods and services. All right. If more loans are being issued by banks, more people are getting loans, more people are borrowing, that means more people are spending, more people are spending on goods and services causes the demand for all goods and services to go up. That is what we mean by an increase in aggregate demand, a shift in aggregate demand curve out and to the right. Okay. What happens if central bank clamps down on the banks right, and reduces the money supply? Banks have less money to lend, so they're going to issue fewer loans, and the loans that they do issue are going to be at higher interest rates. So less money to lend, fewer loans, loans at higher interest rates, that means less money to be spent on goods and services. Right? If less money is being spent on goods and services, less stuff are being purchased, and that's going to cause GDP to fall and aggregate demand to shift in and to the left. So all it only depends on how much money banks have available to lend out, and that is determined by the central bank. If banks have more money to lend out, they're going to lend out more money, and the money that they're going to lend out is going to be lent out at lower interest rates, 
more people qualify for loans, more people are borrowing. Nobody borrows money to turn and put it back in the bank. So that borrowed money is that borrowed money is going to get spent on goods and services, and that's going to cause GDP to rise, which is aggregate demand shifting out into the left. If central bank clamps down on the banks and reduces the amount of money banks have available to lend out, so banks have less money to lend out, and the loans that they do make, fewer people are going to qualify for those loans. And those who do qualify are going to end up having to pay higher interest rates. That means there's less money that's available to spend on goods and services. GDP is going to fall. And we see that as a left or inward shift in the aggregate demand curve. So the first factor that may cause the aggregate demand curve to shift is the money supply. What else? Taxes, value added tax or whatever kind of tax we're talking about. Taxes will cause the aggregate demand curve to shift. If we could only hope there is a, a decline in taxes. Government is taking less money out of our pockets. In that case, consumers and businesses have more money to spend on the purchase of goods and services, and this is, will cause GDP to rise. Okay. And we see this as an outward shift in the aggregate demand curve, out and to the right. All right. If we have more money to spend, we spend more money, we spend more money, we buy more goods and services, that's going to cause the economy to go up, GDP to expand, and we see this as an outward shift in the aggregate demand curve, out and to the right. On the other hand, which, if, which seems much more likely, government increases taxes on us, including um, increasing the um, NIB contribution, because that is a tax, regardless of what they call it, it's a payroll tax that's coming directly out of our salary. If they go ahead with that and they increase the NIB contribution, obviously we have less money to spend because they took more out. If consumers and businesses have less money to spend on the purchase of goods and services, that's going to cause, my apologies, it's going to cause GDP to fall because we're buying less goods and services. And we see that as an inward or a leftward shift in the aggregate demand curve in and to the left. All right. So, so far, the two things that we know for sure is going to cause the aggregate, curve, aggregate demand curve to shift, the money supply and taxes. What else? Government spending, All right? If government spends more, you know, like you just win an election, so now you're a new government, and yeah, you all say I'm a deficit, but you know, we we in charge now, you know. Or election coming, so you know, you know, how much turkey gotta go out, sidewalks gotta get fixed, you know. We have to have a uh, carnival. If government spending rises, government is now buying more goods and services, hiring more people temporary or permanent, whatever it is, right? Government spending more money on goods and services is going to cause GDP to go up. And we see that as an outward shift in the aggregate demand curve, out and to the right. On the other hand, if government finally comes to their senses and realizes that we can't uh, spend like a drunken sailor like we would like to, because, you know, we, find, we come into power and we find the treasury empty, like Bahamians like to say. So if government spending falls, government purchases of goods and services also falls. So they're spending less money, hiring less people, you know, or even, you know, oh no, government's never gonna lay off anybody, but you know. Um, we see this as a fall in GDP, a decline in GDP, 
And we see that as a, a, a leftward shift in the aggregate demand curve in and to the left. Okay. Other factors that may affect the aggregate demand curve would be foreign income. So if, if foreigners, let's say Americans, for example, if they're feeling their pocket, right, for whatever reason they're feeling good, they're much more likely to go on vacation. And Americans like the Bahamas, because we exotic or whatever. Right? That will cause our aggregate demand curve to go up because they're buying more goods and services in the Bahamas, um, using more hotel services, more tourism service, services, more restaurant services, more nightclubs, more tours, et cetera. Right? So if foreign income goes up, it's much more likely it's gonna cause our aggregate demand curve to shift out and to the right. And finally, business confidence. If you as a business person have a, be a real good feeling about the economy, maybe because your boy just got reelected or elected, you're much more likely to invest in the business, expand the business, hire more people, grow the business. In any case, all of those things are going to cause GDP to go up, which we will see as an increase in the aggregate demand curve out and to the right. If there's a decline in business confidence, so businesses are drawing back on their expenditures, cutting back, laying off people, the result is the economy is going to shrink, GDP is going to fall, and we would see that as an inward or leftward shift in the aggregate demand curve, in and to the left. All right. So these are the five factors when I went too far. Five, the factors that would affect aggregate demand, money supply, change in taxes, change in government spending, or changes in foreign income or business confidence. These will cause the, the aggregate demand curve to shift. But we know there are two sides of the story. There's the demand side and there's the supply side. Right. What about the aggregate supply? Aggregate supply is the total supply of all products and services in the economy. And we see that um, as a, we plot the total supply of all of real GDP uh, against the price level. Uh, we'll show the diagrams in a moment. And in fact, there are two types of aggregate supply curves that we want to consider. There's only one aggregate demand curve, downward sloping, but there are two types of aggregate supply curve. There is the long run or classical aggregate supply curve, and then there's the short run aggregate supply curve. All right. So let's start with the long run or classical aggregate supply curve. The classical aggregate supply curve also known as the long run aggregate supply curve. Remember classical economists, they, they assume that in the long run, all factors of production are fully employed. Right? There is full employment and the economy is enjoying a full employment level of output. So first thing when we talk about the classical aggregate supply curve, we assume that we are on the PPC, all right? We are as good as we can do. We are coming along, fully employed, all of our resources, including our labor resources. So therefore, the level of GDP being produced under those conditions is as good as it's going to get. Why star? We call it the full employment level of output. Right. And the long run aggregate supply curve is straight up and down. It's vertical. The long run supply curve is vertical because the economy is producing at its optimal. It's on the PPC. Right. So if everybody's working, all your, all your resources are being fully employed, what happens if there's an increase in aggregate demand? There is, we are already producing all we can produce, right? We're doing the best we can. All our workers are fully working. All right. If there's a, we see, you would see this in the hotel sector, 
uh, when you have your hotel is fully booked out. All right. That's it. All right. All our rooms are fully occupied. What happens if another tall group comes? Because the economy is producing at its optimal, all right, output is independent of the price level. All right. This tall group, this new tall group, uh, can offer to pay whatever it wants to pay. Regardless, I can't help you. All my rooms are booked out. I got no space. I, I, it's nice that you want to pay double. I wish I could take your money, but I got no place to put you. Right. So in the long run, with all of our resources being fully utilized, output or GDP is independent of the price level. So we end up with an, a, 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 an output, a, 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 looks, a long run argument supply curve that's vertical. If there's an increase in demand, the only thing can happen is that we're going to end up with more inflation. A um, few years ago, I bought a new vehicle, um, um, a Ford Explorer, nice big black, like my, I name him Frederick. Anyway, uh, point is, I was looking for a new vehicle, and I ended up at uh, Friendly Ford on JFK. Is it still JFK? No, that's... That uh, is University Drive at that, at that point. That's University Drive. And it's University Drive up until you get to the roundabout, that, the eight-leg roundabout. After that, it becomes JFK. Um, but anyway, um, there was a guy in there, a young guy, maybe early 20s. All right. um, he was looking for a truck, a Ford F-150 truck. Yeah, apparently these trucks have been very popular among a certain demographic you know, for a long time. Right. Um, trucks probably like, I don't know, 60,000. Right. Um, so I'm thinking if you are a dealer uh, like Friendly Ford, and let's say you bring in, I don't know, 80 trucks a month. I don't know if it's that much. I don't know how realistic that is. All right, let's give it a realistic number. Let's say 20 trucks a month. All right, so you bring in 20 trucks, and not even a month. This is me every three months. Right. So you have your 20 trucks, and you price these trucks at, like, say, $60,000 a piece. Now, you now have commitment to sell these 20 trucks. They haven't been sold, you have commitments to sell them. Right. What happens if somebody else comes in and says, yeah, and you tell them, okay, sorry, man, we are, we are, you got to wait, you know, till December when our new shipment come in. And I won't wait. I just, you know, what you do for me? All right. And I, he slips the salesperson there and promises an extra, extra grand. Give you a thousand dollars to make sure that I get on the list for the truck. Right. In essence, that price of that truck has now gone up by $1,000. Right. Now, the 1000 may not end up, end up in the hands of the dealership. It may end up in the hands of the salesperson. But still, as far as the economy is concerned, the price of the truck has gone up. And if someone else comes along after that and insists that they want a truck too, but they're willing to pay even more, slip a bigger amount to the salesperson or even to the dealership to make sure that they get the truck, even if somebody else gets shared out, what you will see happening is that because the supply is fixed, there's no more trucks until the new shipment comes in. The only thing that can happen is that the price is going to go up. 
right? That's the same thing that happens in the economy in the long run, where all of our resources are fully being utilized, right? All of our workers are, are working full time. Right? We have full employment. If there's an increase in demand for a good or service, the only thing that's going to happen is the price is going to go up, inflation. Right? So in the long run, if you look in long run aggregate supply, increase in demand does not lead to an increase in aggregate supply because we can't supply anymore. If there's an increase in demand, the only thing that's going to happen is that we're going to see higher prices or inflation. So that's the case, that's the long run supply, long run aggregate supply. What about the what about um in the short run? The short run aggregate supply curve is in fact horizontal as opposed to vertical. All right. Think about it. We're saying in the short run, Keynesian aggregate supply curve, also known as the short run aggregate supply curve, in the short run prices are sticky. Because remember, that's exactly how we, we define the short run. We define the short run, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We said here, the short run in macroeconomics is a period of time in which prices are fixed. Right? So when we're talking about the short run aggregate supply curve, we're talking about a period of time in which prices are fixed. A sticky is, is really the way we use in economics. So if in the short run prices are sticky and output is determined by aggregate demand, we end up with a horizontal aggregate demand, sorry, sorry that a horizontal short run aggregate supply curve. So in the same scenario, if there's an increase in demand, the price doesn't change because the price is fixed in the short run. The result is, Output goes up, right? We start working more hours, or if you're a hotel, you start asking workers to put in more hours, although you're still paying them the same hourly rate, right? They're now working along the week. Right? So in the short run, the short run aggregate supply curve is horizontal because prices are sticky and they cannot adjust smoothly or quickly in the short run. The result is any increase in aggregate demand, you see the aggregate demand curve shifting out and to the right, any increase in aggregate demand is not gonna change the price level, it's gonna lead to an increase in output. Okay, I wanna stop that at least for today uh, because what I wanna do uh, I do want to um, take a brief review of this uh, on Monday uh, before we proceed, but then we're going to be to begin talking Monday uh, specifically about um, fiscal policy. Um, so we can talk about different types of policies and begin sort of uh, modeling how those policies are going to work and the likely result that's going to happen when we employ those policies. So I know we covered a lot today and I'm certainly open to any questions you may have regarding what we covered today. I do, I do encourage you to go back and reread this. And if you have access to the video from the school, go back and review the video on the YouTube channel. Mr. Demarit. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. No, we do not have the link to go back and review. I. Check with the school. I, I, I have no control over that. You don't have a day. All right, I have no problem. control I'll over that. Check with them. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, uh, we'll take some time and and uh, and then see how much yeah you know, it sinks in. Uh, if you have a chance, there's no homework this weekend, so if you want to review review your, the notes this weekend. Um, Monday, we will go over the exam. Uh, we will briefly review the stuff we covered today, and then we'll begin talking about fiscal policy. What we have to cover for the rest of the semester, we will cover fiscal policy, uh, and we will cover monetary policy, and that really will be it. 
Right? So we'll spend the next couple of weeks just focusing on the policy issues, and we'll see if we can leave some time for at least one class, one review class. All right? All right, okay. folks, in that, in that case, uh, thank you all very much, and I will see you guys on Monday. Okay, good, good night. evening, everyone. Good night.